I think we're gonna get started now. You guys wanna come over. So to the new members, thank you for joining Beard UX. This is a monthly series we do at Neuron. Uh, Neuron is a product design and strategy agency uh, based actually here at 650 California. We work with a variety of clients and we find it important to give back. And that's why we have these sort of knowledge-based events every month. And tonight we have a very special presentation about growth design. This is sort of a really trending topic in UX design and I think, I think we're all going to learn something. And with that said, we have here tonight Paolo, who's a designer at Dropbox. Uh, specializing in growth design, so let's give them a round of applause. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Even in the back? Yes. I speak very well sometimes, so if you can't hear me, just wave. Um, thanks, Chris. I found out there's a laser here, so we're going to be using it throughout the presentation. So as Chris mentioned, I'm a product designer at Dropbox, which you may have heard of. And tonight we're going to be talking about what growth design is. It's a very trending topic right now. A lot of people are interested, and I think you can get value from it, regardless of you're a designer, you're a product person, you're an entrepreneur, you're a developer. Um, so enough about that. If there's one thing, I jumped ahead of the gun. If there's one thing I'd like you to take away tonight is a learning, and growth is a lot about learnings that we'll see throughout the presentation. So I wanted to tell you what I've done in the past in my career leading up to Dropbox. And the way I want to do it is, let's pretend this is a retro or retrospective. So I'll show you what I've done, what companies I've been at and what I've done, and how I've learned and how I've gotten to where I am. So I was at a company called Miniclip that later got acquired by Tencent. It was a gaming company. Uh, we would ship games, mobile and web games. Uh, we ship web games about once every two weeks. So one thing I learned there was moving at speed. And you'll see why that's important in growth design. I then joined, I stayed in the mobile gaming field and I joined a company called Chartboost. Uh, Chartboost still is a mobile games ad network. I would design uh, dashboards for advertisers, publishers, uh, mobile ad formats, so the containers that held the ads. And what I learned at Chartboost was every design decision you make, regardless of it's for the dashboard or the container that holds the ad, has a direct impact on the business. We would be measuring uh, top of the funnel metrics like click through rate all the way to effective cost per thousand. Um, so that's where I learned that design actually can be measured and have an impact that's measurable. Then I started my own company, Payments. Uh, Payments was a huge failure. And the reason I say that, and it's, it's hard for me to say, but I learned a lot at Payments. Uh, I learned that you should fail fast, especially when you have a lot of skin in the game and you're spending a lot of money on it. And uh, I learned to work with an ambiguity, and you'll see how growth design is kind of the best tool. It has a set of tools that you can use when you're working with an ambiguity. Then I joined a company called Strava. Who's familiar here with uh, Strava? Okay, usually it's more people. Um, Strava was, or Strava is a product for runners, cyclists, for active folks. Uh, it allows you to record your activities and it has a social aspect to it. At Strava, I led design on the growth team. We focused on both acquisition and activation. We had uh, mobile products and a web product. At Strava, I learned to expedite learning. We would ship experiments, I think, on good weeks, once a week, sometimes every two weeks. So we would move very fast, we would learn, and then we would build on top of those learnings. And that leads me to my current role at Dropbox, which uh, you may be familiar with. At Dropbox, I focus on acquisition on the growth team. What we're gonna cover tonight, oops, three things. What growth design is, so we're gonna do a little intro. You're probably very interested in knowing what it is, so I'll tell you. Then we're gonna be seeing some frameworks that you can use to design for growth. Regardless, you're a designer, you're a product person, you're a developer, you might find some benefit from incorporating all of this or some of it. And then lastly, we're going to be seeing an actual application of the framework on a real project. So we'll kind of give you a better understanding of uh, how you can apply it on your uh, projects and your day-to-day -day job. All right, buckle up. What is growth design? I can answer that for you. Growth design, I think, is a way of designing products being designed. It's characterized by iteration and experimentation. And what I mean to that is it's extremely empirical. There's a lot of observation involved. And this allows you to move very fast, moving at speed and learning a lot along the way. So I know you might be asking, so why is growth design important? And we're probably all here because we're curious about that. It allows you to move very fast, build products very fast. It allows you to learn while you're moving fast. And this is important because, can everybody see? It allows you to manage risk while you're moving at speed. 
Uh, the reason for this is if you're investing too much in the wrong product or the wrong feature, you can find out very early and pivot. Uh, this is very common within startups. And most important, it allows you to tie value, user value to business goals. What this means, growth often can be perceived as only serving the business, but it's important that you show users unrealized value. And once they find that unrealized value, they'll try to uh, convert, upgrade, what have you, to obtain that value. And it's important because growth ties business and user needs. So, I know you might be asking, like, how can someone design for growth? So, what I want to do tonight is talk about some frameworks that I use in my day-to-day -day job to design for growth. It's going to be a four-step framework. The first one, we're going to talk about a North Star. We're going to say, what is a North Star? How do you measure it? Why a North Star is important? Then we're going to be seeing uh, a mini framework that you can use to understand the space you're working in, uh, better understand the problems that you're trying to solve, and all this is in service of uh, writing some strong hypotheses. Third, we're going to understand how you can explore in lean ways, and cost-effective ways. Uh, you can validate or invalidate those hypotheses, and then you can expand and extract more value once you've found this opportunity, business opportunity. And fourth, uh, we're going to see a cautionary tale, and we're going to kind of talk about how you can be a little more thoughtful when you're building a roadmap of experiments that build one on top of the other. So first off, defining your North Star. So often if you don't have a North Star, you might be feeling like this is the moment I can use a laser, something like this. You don't know where you're going, you don't know what you're doing and why you're doing it. And as a result, your design is less impactful. And what I mean by that is the design decisions you make won't have a specific outcome that you want. It won't have a desired outcome. And as a result, the experimentation won't have a clear direction. Now instead, if you do have a North Star, the design decisions you make actually have an impact that is wanted, that is intended. And as a result, the experiments you do are very focused, and you want to find that focus. How do you measure a North Star? So you measure it through key performance and key performance indicators. What I showed here is acquisition, revenue, on the far right, we see awareness, activation, or attention. What these are, uh, someone refers to them as pirate metrics. David McClure from 500 Startups uh, came up with that word. Pirate because it's A-A-A-R-R, sounds like a pirate, R -R -R. I like doing that. And what this means is acquisition might be top of the funnel kind of metrics. Perhaps you're working in marketing, so you'll be focusing a little more on this, or you're working on a growth product acquisition team. It's sign up, someone coming to your product and converting. It could be buying the product off the bat, uh, perhaps starting a trial for the product, converting at the end of the trial, or possibly if it's a freemium model, upgrading to the premium version of it. And now on the right, instead we see uh, little deeper metrics within the product. It could be, this is actually a top of the funnel, installing the app or downloading the app. But then you have referral rates, so inviting someone into your product. It could be upload rate. At Strava, we call it upload rate when someone records an activity and uploads it to, to the product, to the feed. Follow rate is also important for social networks. You're following other people, you're building your social graph. And then contact sync rate, I put this in there because it's important. If you sync your address book, you're very familiar with all these products that ask you to sync your address book. And you might be wondering, well, why do I do that? Well, it makes logical sense. The product will be able to use that information and suggest better connections. So at that point, you're building a healthier social graph on the product, which means you get better recommendations, better content, and you come back. And related to coming back, you have enablement of notifications. Uh, this is a re-engagement tactic. If you have a product you don't open very often, imagine on Strava, if I get uh, tagged uh, on a Strava activity, I'll get notified, and then I'm pulled back into the product. Headspace does a really good job of this. Every morning they send me a little snippet, a little uh, inspirational quote, and I come into the product, I remember to meditate. But they don't tell me, come back to meditate. They tell me something that's a little more inspiring than that. So I'd like to show this image. This is uh, Archimedes 2,000 years ago. He was an inventor, and he would say, give me one firm spot to stand on, and I shall move the earth. And you might be wondering, well, how can you move the earth? Well, it's simple. You move that with a lever. You don't directly move it. And I think there's some analogies in growth design. So you and your team can find that lever, and once you find it and act on it, you can impact your KPI, your key performance indicators, and your North Star. So speaking of levers, speaking of levers, you want to find it. Once you find that lever, you can amplify the impact you're going to have. And being at Dropbox, I want to show you an example of an early growth lever that Dropbox found. You may be familiar with 
the screen here on the right, uh, referring offender Dropbox. I don't know about you, but I joined about 2011 as a user and I was referred to Dropbox from a friend. This person invited me, they got a little bit of space for free, extra space, and I got some space. And it made a lot of sense because at the time, space was the core value of Dropbox. And so they're giving away very valuable content, bringing you into the product. So if you imagine, what is the North Star? Well, early stage company, growing the user base is very often a North Star you're, you're, you're working towards. So it's bringing in new people. And the way you measure that is your sign up rate, logically. The lever in this case that was identified was incentivized referrals. And what that means, incentivized, is it's a double-sided incentive. I invite you, I get something, you get something. This is obviously very common right now, but we're talking about almost 10 years ago. Inviting someone, getting more space. And that space is very valuable at that point. And obviously the direct outcome uh, that you would see is you're increasing the volume of referrals. It's a direct outcome. But the less direct outcome you want to be looking at, increasing it of new signups. I'm inviting folks, some of them will convert and will actually sign up. And what's interesting here is the new people that are coming in now can contribute to that lever. This is an acquisition project. What you can see is more people come in, more people can uh, impact that lever. And what you've created here is a growth engine. It's a self-sustained growth engine. And this is important because you turn it on and it keeps working. It's important if you're probably an early stage company, this is a great way of finding this a similar type of lever that allows you to identify your growth self-sustaining growth engine. It's gonna go a long way. This leads us to the second uh, part of the framework and it's understanding space and problems to form some strong hypotheses. And hypotheses are very important because they allow you to have that focus. We're talking about having focus, the North Star, something you wanna impact. And a hypothesis, hypothesis is a great way of doing that. So, understanding space and problems, forming hypotheses. I like this picture um, because I like fog, but mainly because uh, often at the beginning of many projects, and this is very common in growth, you might find yourself in a very ambiguous place. You might be tasked with finding new business opportunities and who knows where to find them, who knows what they look like. So you might feel like this. And uh, what I want to tell you is, uh, there are ways to find some direction early on. You don't know where you're going specifically. And enter is a known knowns matrix. Uh, some people refer to it as the Johari window. These are two psychologists in the 50s, or the Rumsfeld matrix from Donald Rumsfeld. We we're, we're not going to go into detail there, but it's an interesting story if you want to Google it. But the reason I mentioned the known known matrix is at Dropbox, our director of growth design, Angel Seger recommends using this matrix. It's a simple framework and it allows you to uh, kind of cut through ambiguity early on. Depending on the size of the company you are, especially maybe at a large company, you might be sitting on a lot of existing data from past research, from past uh, experimentation, or you might have user research that's been done. On the contrary, maybe you don't have anything and you're starting in this quadrant of the unknown unknowns. Uh, you're in the fog. So what you want to do here if you want to make your way up to the top left quadrant, the context, you want to cut through the unknowns and make your way to the known knowns. And what you want to do is you want to bring everything into that quadrant. And what you do, you start with experiments, or you go tap into neighboring teams, past knowledge, see if there's actually anything that's helpful for you. And then you might move back here and experiment being a growth team. So what I did is I took this and I laid it out uh, horizontally, and we can walk through it again. Uh, but it's the same concept we just saw in the matrix. You want to understand the space you're in, and the outcome here is going to be to gather the knowledge, uh, make all the unknowns known. Then you want to define what you want to learn. We talked about writing hypotheses. This is what you want to learn. Then you want to define how you'll learn that, and that means coming up with experiments. Uh, whether you're a designer or a product person, it's understanding what are the changes in the product you will make that will help you either validate or invalidate those hypotheses. And then lastly, you're going to move in the top left quadrant of context, and you're going to be launching those experiments to obtain those learnings. And you see, even here, it's kind of a loop. You'll probably come back here and repeat multiple times, rinse and repeat. This leads us to the third phase. This is actually my favorite part of the process, and it's exploration, validation, and expansion, uh, or extraction. Exploration, validation, and expansion. So I like showing this picture. Um, this was taken in 1915, and it's my great-grandfather. He's pictured here standing in front of an oil rig. And I know you might be asking, this is 2019, it's all over 100 years over uh, this day. 
has to say. And you might be asking, why is he showing us this picture? We're talking about digital product design and we're in Silicon Valley. Well, I'm showing you this picture because I think there are a lot of analogies with what he did over 100 years ago. So he started out, bought some land to cheap. He was pretty poor in the beginning. Started digging, fortunately found some oil, whether that was intuition or he knew something that other people didn't know, he found some oil. At that point, he was able to raise some money on that opportunity, invest more, build rigs, build bigger rigs. Uh, eventually, to the point where he bought a lot of land and kept doing this, he became a millionaire. He was he was rather rich. He lost it all in 1929, so I don't have any of that right now. But the learning I got from that is very interesting. He was doing something that I also do at work, and I realize this is pretty abstract. So you might be wondering, well, how does this actually tie back to growth design and building products? And I'll show you that. I identify the first phase as explore. Here you're working with your shovel, your pickaxe similar to what he was doing in his early days. And what you want to do is you want to move very fast in a cost-effective way and find that opportunity. You'll probably be validating hypotheses, and coming from past experience, most often you'll be invalidating your hypothesis. And that's okay. Next, you move into the oil rig phase, the expansion phase. You're going to be investing more once you validated those hypotheses and found value. And what you'll do is you'll start extracting that value. So again, these are pretty abstract, so I want to show some real examples you can do uh, from a design perspective. So in the explore phase, <coughs> excuse me, I recommend you speak to users first. It's all about being cost effective and moving at speed in this phase. So before even writing a line of code, usability studies with prototypes is a good way of doing it uh, fast, validating with writing. And then you want to focus on areas of the product or surfaces flows that have a lot of traffic. The reason for this is you want to reach statistical significance, SS, uh, rather fast. If you focus on areas of the product where you don't have a lot of traffic of users, an experiment might take a year uh, to wrap up, and you probably don't have that time. Next, you could focus on one platform. Let's say your product exists on iOS, on Android, web mobile, web desktop. It's a great idea to start with one platform, and then once you've found that opportunity, expand into the other platforms. Utilizing existing components. I would say if a specific component won't actually impact the outcome of your experiment, then try using what you already have. There will be a, uh, some time after to actually focus on building new incredible things. Holding off on localization. Depending on the company you're at, the size of the company, localization can also take up to a few weeks. Perhaps you're using external vendors and you're paying for that. And again, you want to move fast, cost-effective. So hold off on localization. And what this means is you might focus on specific geos. Similarly to bullet point number two, where you focus on high traffic because you want to reach statistical significance early, you might focus on English. Often English is the best language because you have more users in that language, but it could be any other. And then my former manager used to say, copy is the interface, and it couldn't be more true when you're doing growth design. And the reason for that is, if it's an experiment or a test, a word in a button could actually make or break an experiment. So you want to be incredibly clear uh, with the copy choices you make. And one thing you could do is usability tests only on copy. We've done that in the past, and you can learn some incredible things uh, just by showing people words. This leads us to the next phase, the expansion phase. The expansion phase is when you want to go in, invest more. You found that opportunity. You have a case uh, you built. So you're going to be improving and personalizing the UX. And what this means is perhaps you have different customer segments. You can build personalized experiences based on these customer segments. Whereas in the explore phase, maybe you focused on one or you tried a more generic approach. You can design for edge cases. You might not design for specific edge cases in the explore phase because the amount of traffic that's coming through or users that are exposed to those edge cases is so small that it's not worthy of investing in it. But you should do that and expand the expand phase, otherwise you'll have some UX debt. Designing for platform parity. So we were saying single platform in the explore phase. Now is the time to bring parity onto the other platforms. Let's say you started with iOS, work on Android, work on uh, web. The risk here is you'll have a product that's overdeveloped and other uh, platforms that aren't. Designing custom components. I was saying hold off on those custom components in the explore phase. Uh, now is the time, if you saw there's value, you validated those hypotheses with the components you had, you can invest a little more now. Localization, it's pretty self-explanatory, you can invest and go localize. Polish, what I mean by that is micro-interactions, maybe withheld on those in the early phase. Uh, perhaps custom illustrations. 
iconography. So this is the moment in which you kind of go in and refine everything. This leads us to the fourth, fourth uh, phase of the framework. It's building experiments roadmap. We were talking about digging, geology, and I kind of want to use that analogy of rocks, and let's stay with that for a moment. If you spend too much time in the explore phase, you might find yourself with a product that's littered with standalone single tests like this. Um, they're very hard to stack one on top of the other to get to your North Star. Remember, we're talking about everything you're doing is a function of that North Star. And these are very hard to work with because they're, like I said, standalone experiments. So I came up with this thing uh, called the quality learning ratio. This is from past experience. Very often, if you invest too little into it, you're going to get learnings that equate to what you put into it. So I have a cautionary tale I made up here to kind of explore, uh, explain what this means more practically. So let's imagine we're at a ride-sharing company and the product team is having uh, one of their meetings and they're drinking LaCroix, LaCroix and uh, someone says, well, our research shows that what our riders want an alternative mode of transportation because they're burdened by traffic. They want to avoid traffic. Idea. But what if we gauge their interest in these alternative modes of transportation uh, with some simple tests in the product, very lightweight uh, test cells? Well, yeah, that's a great idea. It's cost effective and we can learn before investing more. It makes a lot of sense. It's explore phase we talked about. So the product looks like this. You're requesting a ride from point A to B and there's a nice uh, cell, a test cell in there telling you, you can now avoid traffic. It's rush hour with a jet pack. Learn more. Click into that. Oh, bummer. Jetpacks aren't actually ready. They're going to be coming soon, only $3 a ride. I would have really wanted to take a jetpack now because there's a lot of traffic. Okay, and I go back to my product. So the team regroups, the experiment launches a few weeks. The results showed really high engagement with that experiment 99.9% through rate. We're on to something here. Well, People want jetpacks. We asked them contextually during rush hour if they want a way to avoid traffic, and they told us, yes, jetpack is the way to go. So let's invest into it. It makes a lot of sense, right? The explore phase. Well, that's wrong, I think. The reason for that is the experiment quality was rather low, and what that leads to is learnings that are a little blurred, or rather blurred. So like I was saying, if you put too little into it, you risk that the learning is not quality, high quality enough. And as a result of that, you'll have a little pebble, which pebbles are good. Well, you'll be building a boulder on top of that. You're going to build a fleet of jetpacks, which I don't really know. I've never used one, but I imagine it's pretty expensive. So my recommendation is how can we be a little more thoughtful when we're designing for growth and not do a lot of pebble-like experiments, spend too much time in the explore phase? Well, instead of doing boulders on pebbles, do boulders and pebbles here on the right. What this means is you're stacking a healthy mix of small experiments with bigger experiments. And what that does is one uh, helps you reach the next, and this is in service of reaching your North Star at the top. And we'll see what that means. So if you focus too much on pebbles, and this is speaking from personal experience, the people on your team aren't gonna be too happy about it. It's great because you get short-term results, people are excited to see those results, maybe you're making money off of it, but they'll feel like they're not challenged. And this is true for product, this is true for designers, for engineers. You're gonna get really good, possibly good uh, short-term gains. There's a novelty effect there. But they're gonna wane off over time. So you'll have a really high-performing pebble in the beginning. And it's gonna be incredibly hard to shift user behavior uh, just with pebbles. And if you build boulders only, uh, that's also not great. The learnings are gonna take a lot of time. You remember we said you wanna move really fast when you're doing growth. Uh, not too fast, but you wanna move rather fast. And the results that you'll get back are gonna be delayed. As a consequence of that, it's gonna take longer to design, it's gonna take longer to build, the team might not actually see the light at the end of the tunnel and will feel also not as motivated because they're building things they don't actually ship. People wanna ship things. And there's a big risk that the market might shift while you're building. You may not realize it because you're so focused on this big boulder. Another thing, as a consequence of that, we we're saying you want to move fast, you want to manage risk, you won't be able to pivot quickly enough if you focus too much on this. So logically, balancing the two, having a good uh, portfolio of pebbles and a good portfolio of boulders, 
and balancing the two based on juniority of the people on the team, based on their interests. You want to have a healthy mix. People can see, uh, I say the light at the end of the tunnel, they, see, they can see results every few sprints, but they can also work on something a little more meaningful and impactful for their career. So this leads us to the last part of my presentation where I want to walk you through an application of the framework. Well, what we're seeing is an experiment that uh, I built at Strava uh, with Stefan, which is sitting here in the crowd. I always do this. Hi, Stefan. Uh, he was a designer with me at Strava. We are going to see how the four steps of the framework apply to this project. And the project I'm going to be talking to you about is activity tagging. So activity tagging would allow a person that was on Strava that recorded a run or ride to add someone else that wasn't on Strava yet. So we call them athletes. So an athlete could invite someone, add them to that activity, and they could make it theirs. But it didn't start like this. So being an acquisition project, our North Star was growing the user base. And the way we would measure that was through signups. And the lever we identified were in real life interactions linked to Strava. What this means is if I go on a run or a ride with someone that's not on Strava, we're bonded outside of the platform. And how can we leverage that uh, connection to bring people in? So we wanted to understand the space, the problems. We uh, talked to some users. We uh, and we already knew this, actually. There was existing knowledge that athletes are very likely to work out with other people. They work out in groups. And through market penetration data, we know that a lot of these people probably aren't on Strava yet, depending on the country. And word of mouth is extremely strong. People join because of their friends are on the product. So it makes a lot of sense. It's a strong lever. And the problem here, through speaking with users, they were running in often. We had some uh, sessions where we spoke to them. They couldn't add friends that hadn't recorded with them. So if I go on a run with Stefan, and I want to add Stefan to that run so he shows up in my group activity, there was no way for me to do it. I would have had to export a CSV file, send it to him. He would have had to create an account, upload it. It's just too hard. So we came to the phase where we're forming some hypotheses based on that context. So athletes want to add friends that didn't record to their straw activities. It's pretty self-explanatory. We believe that being an acquisition project, that people that aren't on Strava yet are going to be more likely to join and find value when it's someone they actually had that real life interaction with that's inviting them into the product using that uh, activity. So this is what the activity detail looked like there on the right. And what we did is we built some uh, test cells that would allow you to invite someone to the product directly in situ on the activity detail. And we started out on one platform on Android. This was for resource reasons and because we're in the explore phase. The reason for doing this is we want to understand how big that opportunity is. We were rather confident through research and speaking to our users, but we wanted to see within the product what the behavior would be and if it echoed what we already knew. And the goal of this was to validate our hypotheses that we just saw. In the key performance indicators we used to measure at this point were volume of invite sent. Uh, logically, it's the first action you'll take. And then we're looking at the full cycle. We want to see if those people are converting at the end, if there are signups that are deriving from that invite. So we ran our experiment, two weeks, results came back. And we actually found out that people work out with other people that are not on Strava. And this actually changes based on the country you're in, uh, depending on market penetration. And we found out that athletes when given the opportunity to invite people, to include people that didn't work out with them, actually will uh, take action. And our third hypothesis that we validated was, for people that aren't on Strava yet, being added by a friend and having that unique activity you've taken together, you've been on together, is actually a great incentive for you to join. And it's a lot stronger than a simple, hey, join me on Strava. So this leads us to the final phase of expansion. We were in the explore phase. We validated our hypotheses. Now we know we can invest a little more. Obviously, there were many more phases that we aren't going to see. What we did is we built for iOS. We had started on Android only. And what we did is the invite actually became a way of adding friends uh, that were also on Strava. So you could add people that are already on Strava or invite people that are not on Strava. So it's a dual, it serves a dual purpose. Then what we did, we were talking about platform parity. We branched out into web. We branched out into iOS, and then we followed up with web. So we have parity across all 
lines of the product. And then we expanded an experience for locked out users, for those people that aren't yet on Strava, what they can see before coming in. And we want to show them a lot of value of that activity uh, and leverage these beautiful photos and other trends that were on the activity to use, you, to use those to bring you in because it is an acquisition project. So what I wanted to show here was how we started with a simple experiment test, small pebble, and we were able to stack on top bigger pebbles, smaller boulders, and we eventually built this whole product, which is a self-sustained engine, as we saw in the beginning, and it's a very effective self-sustained engine. We solved a concrete user problem, and we found a business opportunity at the same time. So that's all I have before we start Q&A, but I was mentioning at the beginning, I, I kind of want you to leave tonight with one learning, and we talked about learnings. Growth is all about learning. Um, so I want to leave you with this quote from Drew Housen, which is our CEO and co-founder at Dropbox. And he says, not launching, painful, but not learning is fatal. Thank you. I think Chris has the mic. Yeah, there it is. Yes, you have a question? Thanks for your talk, it was great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about how designers and CAMs work together on growth? Yeah. From, from what I found, the most effective, the most successful growth designers, growth product designers, are also very strong product thinkers. Um, we want to form a very solid partnership with both our product partners, but also our engineering partners. Um, at Strava, we refer to it as the tripod or the more fun is the three-legged stool. So I think it's important that, obviously there is a partnership and the roles are defined. Um, the growth, as you've seen, growth is a lot about, there's a really strong business aspect, there's a really strong product aspect into it. So I would say working effectively with a product manager and understanding who should focus on what, but it's imperative that the designer is a strong product thinker. I don't know if that answers your question. The question was, do you care to repeat that? Yeah, no. I mean, just how, what, like, what are the specific roles, maybe across the different teams you've worked on? Yeah. Um, where's the line between product and design, specifically when it comes to growth teams or growth initiatives? So the question is, what is the specific line between roles for product managers, so product folks and designers on growth teams? I'm not sure I have an answer you'll be satisfied with to that. What I have found is that the roles kind of intertwine, uh, given the nature of this, and there's so much ambiguity that I think what designers can do is they can bring the design process to help reduce that ambiguity, and then whether it's using some of the frameworks we've used, bringing user's perspective, bringing some insights that possibly a product manager might not have access to, so whether it's working very closely with researchers, which we haven't talked about, but we saw a lot of the things that we were doing, were infused with actual user insights and research. So I think, coming back to your question, product designers can represent the voice of the users, uh, but they should be aware of the business goals that are happening. And probably the product manager will own uh, sprint planning, cadences, user stories, um, and work very closely to bring in that perspective of the user. Anyone else have a question? Hi, um, thanks for being here. Uh, kind of the same, similar question, but um, how close do you guys work with marketing? Because um, a lot of these KPIs are, um, uh, uh, honestly, traditionally, at least from my experience, marketing KPIs. Um, and so, I guess, how close do you work with the marketing team, if at all? Yeah, I think it depends. I think it depends on the size of the company and if it's a top of funnel impacting project. Um, depending on the company and Strava, we had acquisition, which was a little more marketing focused, and activation, which was uh, within the product, so creating loops within the product that would bring people in from outside. But we worked a little less with marketing. Uh, I would say it depends on the company. Obviously, marketing, at least at Dropbox, marketing is uh, part of the conversation. We work really closely with content marketers. Uh, we may be working on services that are high volume of traffic and user-facing, perspective user-facing, like uh, 
homepage or logged out services, landing pages, and marketing pages. So uh, we have a PMM market, uh, a, PM, a product marketing manager partner that uh, pairs up with us. So again, it depends on the size of the company. At smaller companies, the uh, three-legged stool was product engineering and design. At larger companies, from my experience, you also bring into the mix and you have uh, user research, you have UX writers or content writers, you have PMM. We want to make sure, and I was talking about you know, copy is the interface and a word could make or break an experiment, an experiment. So you want to make sure that you're saying the right things and that you're, I was talking about showing unrealized value and often marketing uh, folks have the best knowledge of what is the value that people are worth are willing to convert for. So to answer your question, it depends on the size of the team. I think it's always great to bring in people that have domain knowledge in that area. And if you're focusing on logged out or prospective uh, traffic, probably marketing is a great asset to bring in. If you're focusing on in-product uh, metrics, you might be working with uh, a different set of people. Research, UX writers. Hi, um, thank you for your talk. That was really insightful. Thank you. Um, I have a question with regards to especially bigger teams, and when like um, the KPI that is chosen for the project is pretty generic, how do you, in the measurement of success, are able to um, point out that the success is due to design and not due to like marketing efforts, not due to like other existing projects that might also contribute to the KPI? Yeah. Um, I think you have to have good traffic control. Communication is key. People have to be talking uh, with neighboring teams. You don't want to be running multiple tests on the same surface at the same time. It's going to be chaos. You won't know what's happening. How do you attribute things? I think uh, first thing is communication is key in, with internal stakeholders. There should be a direct responsible person that is uh, communicating what the experiment roadmap is, how does it clash with other teams. So communication with possibly product managers on different teams, that could be one. Uh, going back to how do you know your design impacts the KPI. Like I was saying initially, you should your experiment should be focused to the point where your experiment is running by itself on that surface, so you can attribute that to the experiment. It's hard because someone could, if we're talking about signing up, uh, you could see an influx of people joining the product because they saw a billboard or there's an ad campaign going out. And I don't know how you know, commercials and uh, you attribute uh, sign ups and people converting to commercials or, or, or billboards, but it's possibly something that might affect. I think the more focused the, the experiment is, the, the easier it is to say this uh, can attri be attributed to that. But again, there could be things happening in the world that uh, bring people into the product. Uh, maybe you get press, uh, an incident happens on your product, or someone famous tweets about something that happened, and you have an influx of people uh, coming in, and this has happened. And at that point, it's hard to say, oh, well, this experiment brought the people in, or was it that article on um, product hunt? Uh, so if you have good attribution and good uh, logging, it'll be easier for you to know, uh, we did this thing on this surface, people were coming in through there, and the last touch point was on that surface. And obviously, I'm not a data analyst, so I don't know how, how that can be tweaked. But I, from conversations we do have, there is a certain flexibility when you're looking at the results that takes into account these kind of things. Sorry, to add on to that. Um, so um, I know that for these smaller companies, they have kind of like not enough resources to do really um, targeted like, um, analytics. So, do you have any like suggestions for how small companies can deal with that? Yeah, again, I'm not an expert on analytics. I'm familiar with uh, certain products, like um, some are easier to integrate, like uh, I forget the name, Hotjar. If you're looking at heat map or how much people are scrolling on the website, it gives you some simple funnels. Uh, you could be using Google Analytics to understand where folks are coming from, where they're dropping off, if it's that simple. Or there's a, a company called Amplitude. They have a suite of products that's great for growth. I'm, I don't know much about it. 
um, but they have an exa a specific product that people can use for growth and they can integrate. And I think it helps solve for smaller companies. I think it's been designed for that. Uh, more optimized, it could be uh, the way of doing it at past companies. We were using Optimizely. It's always a great way of integrating with your website and running experiments through there. So you might have multivariate testing with different button colors or different uh, strings of copy, and you're using Optimizely. I think uh, the risk of using certain tools, which I'm not incredibly familiar with, is you might be doing too much uh, optimization on too many pebbles. Uh, the, one of the things I hope you take away from this is that growth is, is a healthy mix of that, of testing the color, button, the color of the button and the label of the button, because you could be making a good amount of money from that and just changing it. But growth is, is, is a lot more than just testing button colors and, and text fields. It's about finding what people would like to use, what they want, showing them that unrealized value and making it easier for them to obtain it. It's all about, I think, aligning what as a user you value and you need, and as a product, what you offer. And when you find that, it's kind of a match made in heaven. I, I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Uh -huh. Any other questions? Hi, I know that in the, um, there's one slide where you had two phases, the explore and the second part. But for the explore phase, you mentioned the importance of having prototypes. And I guess, how do you deal with that in situations where the growth part doesn't exist yet and you don't have a prototype? So, if I understand correctly, it's how do you move forward when you don't have a way of prototyping? Uh, when you're testing in front of users, you mentioned that you always have a prototype. Did that Growth part doesn't exist yet. The other is the referral yeah. product or something else. Where other ways to go about that if you're still in the ideation phase without the product launch? Do you have hypotheses at that point, or is it even before that? Do you think, know what you're? I think before that, because um, I'm just yeah. I'm just thinking about the line you said. Where you said you said we've always tried first. So I just want to get your thoughts on the cases where. Yeah, I, I, I don't think you always have to have a prototype. I, I believe you can find a way of validating something or learning without having to go through engineering cycles and QA and all that and move faster. Why not do it? It's not, it's not needed. You can move forward without a prototype and actually go out and build the thing. Um, but it's probably going to be more cost effective to have that prototype. I think. Before getting to that phase, if you're, if I understand correctly, you're asking even before you need a prototype, understanding where to focus on. Perhaps you're looking for that opportunity and you're not there at that point of kind of digging with a pickaxe and a shovel. I think a good way of doing it is uh, make sure you have logging in the surfaces, uh, buttons, uh, tool tips, uh, call to action, anything you have where users are interacting with in the interface, make sure you have logging. That's the first step. If you don't have logging, you're kind of moving forward with in the cloud. You don't really know where you're where you're going. Make sure you have logging, have your team implement uh, quick events and, and tracking. And second, once that's done, if you didn't have that, I think looking back, uh, if you have a designer maybe uh, doing a heuristic evaluation, auditing the different flows, mapping them out with user journeys, and then one thing that's really effective is overlaying the quantitative layer on top of that, so you know. What are the emotions users are going through? Uh, even better, where they're coming from? Is it an ad campaign? So go all the way up the funnel and just have this uh, holistic view of where are people coming from, where are they going, and in what percentages and what volumes are they going through this? And I think that's a great starting point, and you could overlay that on top of a customer journey map. So at each stage, you could say, uh, what are the user types that are coming in through here? Segments, perhaps. Uh, what are their needs here? What are the business needs and the business goals? You want to understand if there's a mismatch there. Um, and at that point, you kind of have this, you haven't even written a line of code, except for implementing tracking events, but you have a really good bird's eye view of uh, the whole uh, scenario. And at that point, you can say, okay, let's zoom in into this one area. We see that um, this is impacting negatively this one metric because we've overlaid that data. We want to go in, blow that up, and focus on there. And at that point, you can say, okay, Maybe let's redo the whole process in more in detail on that one area. And now we can say, okay, our hypothesis is this metric is below standard. 
you should have a standard or an opinion of what it should be, and you could say, what are the reasons for this metric being low? Uh, and that'll lead you to uh, what we were seeing in the matrix that I was referring to. It leads you to forming some hypotheses and saying, in a team setting usually, uh, what could the reasons be? Uh, but once you've done your math and you have everything implemented, you want to have no blind spots. You want to be able to see as much as possible what users are doing in the product. And I think it's also great to talk to people, uh, talk to your users. If you have research partner with them, if you don't have research and you have designers, uh, if they're generalists, they might be able to help with that and actually go out with people and watch them using the product. You might find them dropping off at a certain point or not understanding. So maybe you can attribute that drop in that metric to a usability issue. Or maybe there's something even bigger there. So I think kind of combining uh, track, uh, just to recap, add logging and tracking into your product gives you insight, uh, audit everything, um, heuristic evaluation, map everything out, get to the point where you're kind of an investigator in this, in this phase. And I say, uh, I like to say you're an investigator and there's been a crime and you're looking at the cameras now. Look at that camera, you want to understand who came through at what time, what were they doing. And once you have all that, you probably can use that to form some, some good hypotheses. Any other questions? Oh, do you work? <laughs> um, you seem like a pretty interesting guy, and you seem pretty thoughtful. It's there. It's there. <laughs> um, so you said you made your own company called Pay. Pay. Pay less. Yeah, freelance. But um, so what you said was an epic fail. Or I don't know what those are exact words. Yeah, right yeah. actually, I, I realize now I did go into the detail of what it was, but it um, it was a web product that would allow you to share your files with clients. Uh, Illustrator, Photoshop files. Uh, you had a proof of concept with videos also. And what would happen is your files, your source files, would get watermarked. They get stored in the cloud. You generate a link, send that to your uh, client. They be able to preview everything, but not have access to the actual uh, high res or layered source file. So the like creator would do that, and then you can send the asset if you want to work. Yeah, it was a one-to-one -one marketplace for freelancers and clients. And the, what we were trying to solve is, I don't remember the exact number, but I believe about 76% of uh, freelancers claim to uh, struggle with getting paid from customers. So there was no payment or the um, And yeah, it was, it was, it was a failure. It was, you want to know why? Well, so my next question, I have a great idea. I actually really like that idea. <laughs> What was like your biggest takeaway, like your favorite takeaway that you thought was so successful because you said you learned a lot? Like what was the top thing you learned? And then why do you think, you know, what was the biggest negative? Like, you know, the yin and yang of that experience that you learned so much? I know it's a hard question. You can actually stop and then tell me that. I'll take a walk around. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, so I think I failed for, I think the reason I failed, and I'm still not sure, but I haven't kind of grown, is I didn't take into account the fact that there's this human connection when you're sharing something with a customer, with a client, um, and protecting something with a payment, uh, a paywall, might ruin that relationship. You're implicitly saying, I trust you, I like that you commission stuff to me, but I don't really trust you to the point where I need it. I, I need to use this. And, the tricky thing is I had I was freelancing at the time I, I did some design work and I had a client that I really liked and we used to work together and I found myself feeling uncomfortable using my own product. And I had users using it actually, but I felt uncomfortable using it. And I had to email him and say, hey look, do you mind if I use the product? He's like, yeah, sure, dog food, use it. And I felt a little uncomfortable and I realized like, oh damn, there's something here. Um, now I think uh, I, was, I was funding it with my own money I got to the point where I left a six-figure salary paying job and, and you know I did it. Uh, I I struggled with depression, anxiety. I kind of fell into a black hole and, and I, I, I struggled with depression. So it kind of came out in that moment. And I was wearing so many hats. I, I remember having a little identity crisis and I didn't realize, am I a designer? Am I a, an entrepreneur that's everything? Uh, especially if you're kind of bootstrapped for money and you're trying to launch a product and I was doing marketing emails, I was doing A-B tests on emails, I was designing uh, illustrations for the marketing side, I was designing my Facebook ads, I was running my ad campaigns, I was uh, managing an engineering contract, or I was doing a vision roadmap work, and 
I realized I, I, I needed to feel, and I don't know if this is right or wrong, but I needed to feel like I am a designer. I am a whatever role it was. So I, I think I struggled with that, and maybe I'm not made to start companies, but one thing I do appreciate of growth, and I think if any of you do growth here or are looking to get into a growth product role or growth design role, every day when I go to work, I feel like I'm starting a new company. Um, and I get to do this with like these incredibly smart people and these great resources we have. Um, and the ambiguity that a growth team has. And I was talking to my manager today, and I was like, I love ambiguity. Like, put me in a project that is ambiguous, and I want to find direction in that. And I think you might fall in love with growth if you like that ambiguity. Um, growth design can be a lot of things. It can be you know, running A-B tests on buttons and labels. It can be starting your own company. I think what I showed today is kind of the product of some of my experience as a designer, but also my experience as being an entrepreneur and starting that company. And often, you know, I, I ask myself, well, am I a designer or a product person? Because I enjoy building products so much. And going back to the initial question, I think great growth designers are great product makers. And there's nothing wrong with that. We need product managers and find a great balance with a product manager. And like I said, the superpower of designers and designers bring this empathy, bring that perspective of users to the table. And if you have that strong product well, even better. I mean, it's, it's only for the good. There was one, there was, so it's a good thing and a bad thing. What did I say? Well, first, I don't think that's failure when you learn something that important about yourself, right? So that's, I don't know if that answers both questions. Because I think six, we're, we're in Silicon Valley and we think of we either build, you know, it's a lifestyle company or if it's a hyper growth company. And at the time, I wanted to build a hyper growth company. And, I failed at that. So it's subjective. With the lens I was using at the time, I failed. I wanted to raise money. I wanted to have you know, a nice office and a ton of people and a product that was used by millions of people. And the first, I remember the first transaction we had, we were using Braintree. So we had their dashboard. And the first transaction we had was $450. Someone got paid for a logo. And I remember I cried when I saw it. And I thought, the first thing I thought was, I imagine someone like Steve Jobs, millions of people are using a product that they imagined and designed and just that feeling was like if I can come up with something that people will gain benefit out of, it's so powerful. And I think working at any kind of company, you, you have that impact and that's kind of the beauty of being a designer, it's the beauty of being in Silicon Valley is the things you come up with, the things that you're working towards are actually impacting millions of millions of people. And I wasn't able to impact millions of people with with my company. So I, for that reason I think it was a failure. And with the lens of learning, the growth lens, and it's taken me a few years to start accepting that and, and talking about it. And sometimes I, I kind of want to cry when I talk about it on stage. Um, I, I'm getting over it, and I think the learning there was you're comfortable with ambiguity, um, just in life. At work, you can they'll throw anything at you uh, from a product perspective, from a complex problem, and you can kind of unravel that and find your way out of it. And I think that's the biggest learning from starting your own thing because nobody's there to tell you what to do. Nobody's there to tell you what you should be doing first. And it's like, figure it out. Well, thank you for being so open with us. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's therapy. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Okay. I think that's all the time we have for Q&A today. But that was an amazing presentation. And let's give Paul a round of applause. <laughs>